No, I'm severe, and thanks for asking me. And I'm glad I caught the last part of that last presentation. Number one, Amy and I recommend mindfulness therapy for every one of our patients. Psychosocial issues are actually very important in triggering heart attacks, strokes, and causing arterial disease. So hopefully everybody listened carefully to what Robin had to say. I certainly did, and what I learned, I did that calculation, I came out with a minus number. <laughs> And then I said, well, I am a miracle. <laughs> I'm pinching myself. I shouldn't even be here, and I'm very grateful <laughs> to be here. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, that was a good presentation. But yeah, I'm, I am extremely happy to be here, and my job really is very easy. All I have to do by the time I leave is make sure every one of you in this room realize how important you are. You're extremely important. You're saving lives. We're going to talk about heart attacks and strokes, and that's right in your bailiwick of work. So if you weren't doing an excellent job with your oral health care, more patients would be dying. So you are saving lives, and I don't care if you're the dentist, you're the hygienist, you're the front office staff, the whole team is important and everybody needs to be on the same page with this message so I've got it easy right I just have to convince you and make sure you realize you are extremely important and the work you're doing is saving lives you should be proud of it and you should be talking about it so Amy and I both have these academic appointments we're professors now at a medical school, which we're excited about. The dean of this new medical school read our book, read about our method, and wants to integrate it throughout the curriculum of the medical school. We're also on faculty now at a dental school, which we're excited about, and we're helping them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The University of Kentucky College of Dentistry, and we're working with Dr. Craig Miller there to establish a wellness clinic, which will be with the dental students, and they're gonna have a nurse practitioner on board trained in our method to be on guard for cardiovascular risk and disease in these patients they're seeing. So we're excited about that. We also wanna work with them on uh, furthering some research. And then we're adjunct professors at Texas Tech Health Science Center in the College of Nursing, and we're working with them to get this type of care brought to indigent people. So we're excited. And then we both have private practice as well. In terms of disclosures, I'm a consultant for my genetics. So I'm not sure I have much genetics, if any, in this program, but keep that in mind. We're biased. We use this company a lot for genetic testing, which helps anchor us in precision healthcare. So hopefully this is the reason you're in the room to hear the presentation I'm gonna give. These statistics just came out three weeks ago. So they're the latest that we have on heart attacks. Somebody in this country is having a heart attack every 40 seconds. They're dying from one about every minute. And a third of the people who have a heart attack will be dead within a year. The average age for a man to have a heart attack is right at retirement. Which doesn't seem fair, does it? Poor guy works hard all his life, saves up some money so he can do some travel, boom, they get taken out with a heart attack. Women, it's a little bit later, 72. That's the average. And it is the largest cause of premature death. It robs people of 16 to 17 years of good life. And it's been the number one killer since 1900. <laughs> and that's really ridiculous because we've been at a point now for several decades where we can take it off the top of the list, but to do that, 
we do need your engagement and your help. You are important. If we're going to take it off the top of the list, we have to have more people like you who are educated on it. The other reason, hopefully you're listening to this talk, is strokes. Again, these statistics just came out three weeks ago, so they're the latest. Somebody's having a stroke in this country every 40 seconds. They're dying from one every three minutes and 45 seconds. So since Chris introduced me, certainly at least one person in this country has already died of a stroke. Probably about five have died from heart attacks and every 40 seconds are having a stroke or heart attack. So a bunch of people in this country have already had heart attacks or strokes the short time I've been up here. And women need to realize in terms of stroke, about 55,000 more women every year have strokes than men. There are a lot of beautiful gals in the audience. Hopefully you're not pleased with that statistic and you want to help us change it. And you can with your excellent work in oral health. Do you know anybody who's had a heart attack or stroke? That's a laughable question, right? They're so common. Everybody knows somebody, usually a relative or a close friend. And then there are lots of people who get publicity from it, like Bob Harper who was the host of the world's greatest loser in excellent physical condition, had a heart attack a year ago. And then quite a few months later, somebody finally tested him for the inherited cholesterol problem, lipoprotein A, which was at the root of his disease. And nobody had ever tested him, even right after he had his heart attack. It took a while before they got the diagnosis. So he's up in arms over that, like Amy and I have been for 20 years. We've been talking about lipoprotein A, and we've been measuring it in every patient for 20 years. And then the president of the American Heart Association in November, as he was giving the opening ceremony address, to the American Heart Association had to be rushed off stage with a heart attack. He's a cardiologist. He's a nice person. He did survive it. We actually sent him our book. And we sent him a very compassionate letter. And I'm happy to report to you, he sent us back a handwritten note, which was very nice, and said he was going to read the book and he thanked us for the work we're doing. And hopefully he will read the book so he doesn't have another heart attack because they're all preventable. But it's very apparent we need to change the platform in terms of heart attacks and strokes. We can't just be waiting for them to happen and then do all these miraculous procedures to try and keep people alive, like putting a stent in them bypassing them, giving them an artificial heart, a transplant. We need to prevent the heart attacks and strokes. And we believe the Chinese had it right 4,500 years ago when they stated an inferior healthcare provider treats the full end-stage disease like a heart attack or stroke. That's an inferior healthcare provider. A mediocre healthcare provider treats the disease before it's obvious. And a superior healthcare provider print prevents the disease, period. And in our culture, of course, the financial rewards are just the opposite, 180 degree different. You could argue the pediatricians should be the absolute superior healthcare providers in our culture they get paid less than any other doctor in the United States. So this has to change, and we can change it, and with your help, we certainly will. So the reason I'm here speaking to you is the heart attacks and the strokes absolutely can be prevented. Nobody needs to have one. I mean, that's fantastic news. It's as big as a killer. And you're telling me they're all preventable? Yeah, they are. They're all preventable. And our book, Beat the Heart Attack Gene,
covers a lot of the elements of what's necessary to make that occur. And why am I speaking to this group? Again, your work in oral health is critical in terms of arterial disease and the prevention of heart attacks and strokes. And if you didn't know it, when you came in this room today, I'm glad you're here. And hopefully by the end of my presentation, you're gonna know it down to your core, how important you are. And you're gonna walk out of here and nobody's gonna shake your tree on it. And when you go to bed at night, you're gonna be happy because you know you're saving lives. Amy and I have been interested in oral health for a lot of years. And we were very pleased when several years ago, the American Heart Association came out with this publication stating that periodontal disease with level A evidence is independently associated with arterial disease. That was a huge statement. Level A evidence is extremely hard to acquire. You have to have multiple populations showing the same results to get level A evidence. 86% of medical guidelines are based on evidence less than level A. So that's a big statement in there. And then independently associated was a big statement as well, because that means periodontal disease remained a predictor of arterial disease after they adjusted for every known cardiovascular risk factor they could come up with. Like what's the blood pressure? What's the cholesterol? How much does somebody weigh, et cetera. And after adjusting for all those things, periodontal disease was still a predictor of risk. So that was a powerful statement and we were very pleased to see it. But a lot of people were upset because, well, it didn't show causality. Well, there's no way they could show causality because the studies they reviewed, almost 100% of them, the pathogens involved in the periodontal disease were never measured. And it's the high risk periodontal pathogens that are causal of arterial disease. If you start measuring these high risk periodontal pathogens and you look at the treatment of those pathogens, you'll definitely show a huge reduction in heart attack and stroke. So the paper that Amy and I published in Postgraduate Medicine, which is an offshoot of the British Medical Journal, one of the most respected journals in medicine, we got this published where high-risk periodontal pathogens are actually causal of arterial disease. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit later. But it's like my partner, Dr. Donine, likes to say, you know, oral health, we consider it a medical problem. It's a medical problem for us. We know if our patient has bad periodontal disease with high-risk pathogens, they have abscesses in their teeth, they could have a heart attack or stroke at any moment, and they're also at risk for further development of arterial disease. So for us, it's a medical problem. But we don't know how to treat periodontal disease. That's what you do. I don't know how to take care of a periapical abscess. That's what you do. So we absolutely need to come together if we're gonna take heart attacks and strokes off the top of the billboard as the number one cause of death and disability. And we published this in a peer-reviewed journal four years ago, the Journal of Clinical and Experimental Cardiology. And the title of the publication is, is very exciting. A guarantee of arterial wellness. We now live in a new era of healthcare where you can literally guarantee that the arteries stay well. If they're diseased, you can bring them to a healthy state and you can maintain that. And when you do that, people aren't gonna have a heart attack or stroke. You know what else doesn't seem to be happening? Our patients don't seem to get dementia. 
They don't get Alzheimer's. They don't get heart failure. They don't lose their kidneys. They don't have to go on dialysis. Men, if they come to us prior to erectile dysfunction, they're not gonna get erectile dysfunction. People don't get peripheral arterial disease. They don't have to have parts of their lower limbs amputated. So there are lots of additional spinoffs beyond the heart attack or stroke. So this is very exciting that we now live in this era. And it, the reason we were able to publish this paper is because we now have the technology to go find arterial disease before you feel it, before you have a heart attack or stroke. A hundred years ago, we didn't have that. To know you had arterial disease, you had to develop symptoms, have that heart attack or stroke. Well, goodness sake, we got technology now to go find this disease long before you have to know it's there or it has to hurt you. And then the second element is we now have the knowledge of what causes arterial disease. And with those two elements, we've got technology to go find the disease and we've got the knowledge of what causes it, you can absolutely shut it down. So this is our method depicted in this cartoon. And I think it's definitely one of our best cartoons. So our method has now been around for 17 years. The platform that Amy and I stand on with the Bale Donine method, every patient we see, we look for disease in the wall of the artery. And we can do that with various techniques. Ultrasound, I think you had that here today, that's one. Your panoramic x-rays you take, if you see calcium in the carotid artery, guess what? They got disease. We can do coronary calcification. There are lots of tests we can now do that don't cost much money and they don't hurt people. So our platform is to assess every person we see. Do you have disease? You have to have disease to have a heart attack or stroke. You can't have a heart attack or stroke if you don't have disease, but if you have disease, yeah, you could have a heart attack or stroke. Whereas the standard of care is still, oh, well, let's look at risk factor. How old are you? Are you male or are you female? What's your total cholesterol? What's your good cholesterol? Do you smoke or not? And we'll tell you if you're at risk for a heart attack. That's ridiculous. <laughs> having disease in the wall of the artery is sine qua non to having an event. So our platform has always been, we're gonna look at every patient to see if they have disease. We can do that now. And that platform is held up by a very powerful, powerful arch. And it starts, it's nicknamed Ed Frog. The E stands for education. We concur with Nelson Mandela that the most powerful weapon we have to change the world is education. So our patients have to understand it's not the buildup of cholesterol in the artery that blocks flow of blood, it's a blood clot. <laughs> That's critical for them to understand. So we educate all of our patients about that. Then the D stands for disease. Do you have disease or not? Let's take a look. Don't need to be afraid of it because if you have it, we know what causes it, we'll evaluate you, we'll shut it down. What you should be afraid of is ignorance and not knowing whether or not you have disease. So that's the D. The F stands for fire, inflammation, because it's inflammation that causes arterial disease. Then the R stands for the root causes of inflammation. The O stands for if there's an issue causing inflammation of the artery, we want it optimally managed for that individual patient, which frequently means going beyond the standard of care. And then the G is extremely powerful as well as the education. We've been doing genetic testing from the get-go and our menu keeps expanding, of course, because that field's exploding. But if you want to treat that one individual patient in front of you for the individual they are, the more genetic information you can get, 
the better off you are for your management advice and the patient is for what you're going to tell them to do. We're all biologically unique. That uniqueness rests in our genes. So we can give precise management advice for individual patients. And you have that opportunity in oral health with DNA testing from the saliva to know the inflammatory response that patient is more likely to have if they have disease. So that arch is extremely powerful and the keystone is inflammation. So if you build an arch and it doesn't have a strong keystone, good luck. The platform may crumble. Our platform will not crumble. Our method is very dynamic. We look at the latest studies and we refine it as science keeps advancing. But this basic arch, powerful. Our medical colleagues doing the standard of care on this other platform, risk factors. <laughs> and those cards frequently crumble, unfortunately. And that's why every 40 seconds in this country, somebody's gonna have a heart attack. Every 40 seconds, somebody's gonna have a stroke. And it's the largest cause of premature death. So that's our method, the bail donating method. And Brian, yeah. the dentistry's not in the right side where the cards are falling down. Part. The <laughs> dentistry in that part. But it, the problem was originally your arch there was inflammation. And the most common form of inflammation of the whole body is periodontal disease. Yep. <laughs> so we're going to dive into the, that keystone, the inflammation, because that is what causes arterial disease. The first doctor that we know of who proposed it was Dr. Vokal in Germany 162 years ago. 162 years ago. And then since that time, numerous other experts have published papers. It's inflammation that causes arterial disease. And then Amy and I felt, well, we felt the data was strong enough to start putting that as the keystone 17 years ago. But we knew it was confirmed beyond any shadow of a doubt several years ago when these genetic studies were published. To keep it real simple, they looked at hundreds of thousands of people. Some of these people inherited an issue where they do not have the same amount of receptors in the liver for cytokine to attach to. And it's the cytokines that will drive inflammation. And if you don't have the receptor for it attached to, it isn't going to cause inflammation. And they clearly showed in these two huge studies that individuals who had inherited that paucity of receptors in the liver, they had significantly lower risk of ever developing arterial disease. So in our opinion, that was it, that confirmed it. But some of our medical colleagues still weren't on board. They still wanted to hang on to cholesterol is what causes arterial disease, which is ridiculous, but a lot of experts still were trying to hang on to that, despite all the evidence that had been there for decades. Until a trial was published just a few months ago called the Cantos trial. In this trial, they took 10,000 people who had known coronary artery disease. Over 80% of them had already had either bypass or stents and they were on optimal medical therapy. So their cholesterol was clobbered, their blood pressure, antiplatelet therapy. And they randomized these patients where they could get a drug which only blocks interleukin beta, that cytokine, interleukin 1 beta, which is a cytokine which generates inflammation, a monoclonal antibody to block it. And in this study, that drug reduced non-fatal heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular deaths 
very significantly at 14% and nothing happened to cholesterol, nothing. So then all the experts like Dr. Nissen at the Cleveland Clinic, he's a world famous cardiologist. He came out with this statement. This was August 30th, not that long ago, after that study was published. For the first time, <laughs> wow, we have this new target, inflammation. It's sort of the dawning of a new era. I really think it's big. <laughs> Too bad he didn't come to our course 17 years ago, right? <laughs> but at least he's catching on. So it's really a hallelujah. And then shortly after that, in the American Heart Association Journal Circulation, this was published. The end of the controversy. It's over. It would be hard to find a medical provider now that doesn't believe inflammation is the cause of arterial disease. And if you find one, I would argue they may be Rip Van Winkle. They've been asleep for a while. <laughs> anybody who's awake and alert is going to realize that controversy is done. It isn't cholesterol. It's inflammation that causes arterial disease. So for Amy and I to guarantee our work with our patients, what we have to accomplish, if you want to keep it real simple, we just have to keep that patient's arteries cold. If we keep the arteries cold, their body's going to stay warm. They're not going to have a heart attack or stroke. But if those arteries are real hot, their body could get real cold for a long, long time. And that's why we love speaking to an audience like this, because as you're going to see, one thing that can fire up the artery is oral health conditions. We don't know how to treat it. We've got to have you. You're very important to us. So we have to have simple biomarkers that'll tell us if the artery's on fire or not. And we have them. There are basically six tests we use. Two of them are urine tests. You don't even have to stick somebody's arm for it. You just pee in a cup. And then four tests that are blood tests. But we feel confident these tests are what we monitor on a routine basis with our patient to make sure that artery gets cold and it stays cold. Because when we first see people, of course, usually there's work to do. You're going to have to go extinguish some fires. And then you want to make sure it stays extinguished. So really, we're just firefighters. That's what we are. And it sounds like, hey, maybe Dr. Nissen will join us now. What do you think? <laughs> he should come to our course, because he probably doesn't realize all the potential causes of fire. But this is one of my best Christmas presents. It came from Patty and Tim Pronger. And her brother is the head of the fire department in Tucson, Arizona. So that's a real fireman's hat. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. I have it hanging in my office. <laughs> so if you're going to put out fires, you got to know what's causing them, right? Because you could actually cause harm, potentially, if you don't know what's causing that fire. You put water on a grease fire, good luck. Your house is probably going to burn to the ground. <laughs> and it takes a holistic approach. Because this is, I would argue... Our other, we have two cartoons that I think are superior to all the others. Our method one I showed you and this one. The trunk of the tree is on fire. It's inflamed. And that's what causes arterial disease. It causes heart attacks and strokes. Well, what can cause the trunk of the tree to get on fire? <laughs> there are a slew of things. So I'll just quickly show you a few of them. If you have any type of sleep disturbance, it can fire up the artery. It doesn't have to be just sleep apnea. If you have that inherited lipoprotein A problem, that'll fire up the arteries. Low vitamin D, 
inflammation of the arteries. Blood pressure actually causes inflammation of the arteries when it gets high. Yes, the cholesterol is one, okay? <laughs> it's one of many. <laughs> Periodontal disease, definitely in your arena. Genetic, there are genetic conditions we test for that are related to how much inflammation the patient's going to generate. Insulin resistance, which is pre-diabetes, diabetes, huge cause of fire. Dysfunctional HDL, endodontic disease, dental caries, periapical abscesses, inflammatory diseases like lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, asthma. All of those can fire up the arteries. Infectious diseases like the flu, pneumonia, can literally trigger heart attacks and strokes. And then nicotine, of course, and gut dysbiosis. So there are lots of things that will fire up the arteries. But what we're going to do today is focus on oral health. And we're happy to do that because as Chris alluded to, we run into this all the time as a driver of fire in the arteries. Why? Of course you know why. Once somebody's 30 years of age, 50% of people have periodontal disease. Once they're my age, 70% of the people have periodontal disease. It's all over the place. And endodontic disease isn't uncommon either, I would argue. Okay. So it's, yes. I just want people to appreciate the picture because those aren't apples hanging from the tree. Those are the cross section of the artery. So we've got a healthy one on the left side. There's some plaques in the lining of that next one. And then you see how the plaques are building to that one on the far right. That, that one looks like maybe an apple or whatever. That's that cross section of a very, very busy yeah. artery with right. it broken through. Right. And that's what a heart attack happens. But Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Oh, good explanation. Okay. So, one thing I'm sure you let your patients know is that, hey, these bugs you have in your mouth, they just don't stay in your mouth. And we know they travel all over your body, and we've known that for a long time. Every time you eat, when you have lunch today, 17% of the time you're going to get a bacteremia from the bugs in your mouth. Hopefully people are brushing their teeth a couple of times a day, right? So a couple of times a day, 24% of the time when you brush your teeth, those bugs take a journey throughout your body. When you extract a tooth, 35% of the time, and when you do those deeper periodontal cleanings, 40% of the time. So I would think you'd want to make sure your patients know that because there may be some of the public don't really understand that. They think, oh, well, there's germs in my mouth. What are you worried about? We're worried about it because it goes through your body. <laughs> they don't just stay in your mouth. And that relates, of course, to our study. So I'm going to zero in on our study. Again, high-risk periodontal pathogens as a contributory cause, not association, but cause of arterial disease. So how were we able to make this argument? To get this published, I'll tell you, it took a year and four revisions, because the peer review process is extremely severe with a journal like postgraduate medicine. So your science has to be thorough, and it has to be solid or forget it. They're not going to publish your paper. So our paper was based on the fact that we know there are three things necessary for somebody to form disease in the wall of their artery. One thing is the concentration of ApoB in the blood. ApoB is a protein attached to all the cholesterol particles. LDL, VLDL, IDL, lipoprotein A, etc. So it gets transported through the body. So ApoB is on all of them. So this isn't LDL, it's ApoB. That concentration is important. The other thing that's important is the health of the inside lining of the artery. 
what you know it as, as the endothelium, that single layer of cells that lines all of our vessels. And Amy and I call it the tennis court, because we have 60,000 miles of vessels in our body. If you took all those cells out of your body, you could cover four to six tennis courts. And it's arguably the most important organ in your body because it has to fail twice before you can have a heart attack or stroke. The first failure is when it allows that cholesterol and the white cells to go in after the cholesterol to build up that disease, that plaque, that cholesterol buildup in the wall. That's the first failure. But you have to have the second failure where it cracks or breaks, and that's when you get the clot. And it's a clot that blocks the flow of blood. So that tennis court's extremely important. And when it's healthy, you're not going to develop arterial disease. But the third element, most of our medical colleagues haven't caught up with. Why is that? Because the evidence for it's only 10 years old. How long does it usually take for good scientific evidence to be utilized clinically? 25 to 30 years. So it'll still be another 10 to 15 years unless they listen to what we're telling them, then maybe they'll catch up a lot faster. The third element is actually the first thing that has to happen in order to form disease in the wall of the artery. And I'll explain it in some detail in a minute. The first thing that has to happen, you have to stop those ApoB particles from going right on through the wall of the artery. You have to trap them in that first layer underneath the tennis court. And that was the missing element and what allowed us to get this paper published. And I'll show you this study that was published looking at a high-risk periodontal pathogen in that regard of trapping the particles. Once that was published, Amy and I looked at each other. Aha, we got it now. We've got all three elements of the triad where we can show high-risk periodontal pathogens influence all of them in the wrong way. And when that's the case, you have to call it causal. So the first one, there's lots of evidence. This is just one where high-risk periodontal pathogens, we know increase the concentration of ApoB. So if you have high-risk periodontal pathogens, you're gonna have a higher concentration of ApoB in your blood. The second element with the tennis court, that was real easy. We've had that science for years and years showing how high-risk periodontal pathogens will cause the tennis court to get inflamed, become leaky, dysfunctional, and it deals with four big elements, the innate immune system, the adaptive immune system, direct toxic effects, and then the one bacteria we put in as high risk that didn't normally put there on reports is FN because it's published FN opens up the tennis court. You just open up the floodgates if you have FN. So we put FN in there. But lots of science to back up. Yeah, high-risk periodontal pathogens will create a sick tennis court. That's bad news. And then that third element the new twist that a lot of our colleagues haven't caught up with deals with the trapping of those particles in that first layer right underneath the tennis court, the intima. And a lot of people still think, well, God, the first step has to be the tennis court. It has to get sick. It has to get leaky. It has to get inflamed. No, it doesn't. Why? Because it's been proven the cholesterol particles are so small, they go right through a healthy tennis court. It doesn't need to be inflamed or sick at all. It goes right through the cell, a process called transcytosis. The only particles that are so big they can't do that are right after you eat the huge chylomicrons. LDL goes right through, lipoprotein A goes right through. VLDL, IDL, they just go right through. You don't have to have inflammation at tennis court. And this study was published where they radioactively labeled, labeled those particles and they showed 
When they go right through the tennis court, they hit the next layer, the intima. They go right through the intima. The next layer is the vascular smooth muscle cells, the media. They go right through the media. They hit the next layer, the adventitia, the outside layer of the wall of the artery. They go right through it and they get picked up by the lymphatic and venous system and the cholesterol gets recirculated. In order to form arterial disease, you have to trap those particles when they're coming through in that intimal layer. So the first step in the pathogenesis of arterial disease is the trapping and retention of those cholesterol particles, the ApoB, followed then by infiltration and accumulation of the white blood cells. Because those particles, when they get trapped in the intima, they get oxidized. Then that sends out signals that start trapping white blood cells on the tennis court. So the white blood cells start coming in trying to clean up the mess. But you can see when this was published, published 10 years ago. So if you go talk to a medical provider about this, isn't it fascinating? I didn't realize the first step in forming arterial disease, you have to stop those cholesterol particles from flowing right through the wall of the artery. They're gonna look at you like you lost your mind. <laughs> so you might wanna pick up this study and show it to them. Well, this was published 10 years ago, okay? <laughs> So what is it that'll stop them? What's the Velcro that grabs onto the particles? It's called proteoglycan. Proteoglycan has a protein core, polysaccharide chains coming off of it. The polysaccharide chains have a negative charge. Guess what has a positive charge? ApoB. That's why ApoB has always been the best predictor of risk. Hopefully in your medical record, you know what your ApoB is. The chances are your medical provider simply did total cholesterol, HDL, triglyceride, and LDL. You really want to know what your ApoB is. And that was published two years ago in the Journal of American College of Cardiology that if doctors started using ApoB instead of LDL, we would prevent a half a million heart attacks in the next 10 years. Half a million. <laughs> so it's ApoB that gets stuck. And we know the sites on ApoB for getting stuck. And one of those sites is only available on small dense LDL, which high risk periodontal increase the concentration of high dense small LDL. <laughs> So if you're a small dense LDL, you got twice the chance of getting stopped. You can get stopped on the main receptor, or you can get stopped on the other one. The one in the middle is just for those huge chylomicron type particles that have ApoB48 instead of 100. That's too much science. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. So where does this Velcro come from? How do you get proteoglycans in the intimal layer of the wall of the artery? The vascular smooth muscle cells in the medial layer can morph. They can get gen genetically transformed, just like my twin granddaughters. I'll be looking at them one minute, they're hugging each other, kissing each other, the next minute they're in a fight, <laughs> you know, chasing each other. Well, that can happen with the smooth muscle cells. They can get genetically transformed. And again, this was published 11 years ago, so don't expect medical providers to realize it yet. But smooth muscle cell transition to a migratory, secretory, where they secrete these proteoglycans. They move out of the media. They move into that deep layer of the intima. Make this Velcro that's gonna stop the cholesterol. <laughs> That's what initiates arterial disease and causes it to propagate, continue to grow. That's what does it. These cells move into the intima, produce the proteoglycans, trap 
that ApoB. Smooth muscle cells are the first cells in the intima that are present in locations destined to get arterial disease. The intima doesn't usually have cells in it. The first cells to get there in a spot where you're going to develop arterial disease are these smooth muscle cells that got genetically transformed. Then deposition of the ApoB in the deep layer is what will start to cause the formation of disease in the wall of the artery. Hopefully, if you understood that, you should be real happy because you're ahead of 99.9% .9 of medical providers. Believe me. They don't know this. So how can you change those smooth muscle cells? Well, that's what allowed us to publish the paper. And we, when this was published, what I'm going to show you is when Amy and I said we've got to get a paper published showing it's causal. It had been published that the high-risk periodontal pathogen, PG, can change the genetics of cells. So they wanted to investigate, will it change genetically how much angiopoietin 1 and angiopoietin 2 are in arterial cells. And they're found also in the smooth muscle cells and they influence whether or not that smooth muscle cell is going to get transformed to a migratory secretory smooth muscle cells. And what they found in this study was your high-risk periodontal pathogen, PG, increased the genetic expression of, decreased the genetic expression of angiotensin 1 and increased angiopoietin 2, okay? And angiopoietin 2 is what causes the smooth muscle cells to get transformed. So your high-risk periodontal pathogen is extremely dangerous, probably more dangerous than you ever realized. And hopefully you're thinking of children right now, because we know a lot of children are developing arterial disease. If their parent has PG, hopefully you can educate them and get them to evaluate their child, because the child probably has it too. These high-risk periodontal pathogens, it's a family affair. <laughs> So the authors of this paper, this isn't Amy and I saying this, this is the authors of the paper, concluded, hey, this is another mechanism by which periodontal disease is associated with arterial disease. It's by causing that genetic transformation of these smooth muscle cells. And that results in the thickening and trapping of those particles. So when that was published, literally within a few days, Amy and I decided that's all we need. We already had the two other elements. This is a third element. Now we can publish this paper. Periodontal disease caused by high-risk pathogens influence all three elements necessary to form arterial disease in the wrong way. So it has to be considered causal. So that's the illustration that's in there, the three elements and how periodontal disease with high-risk pathogens enhances all three elements. So we were happy. We were almost a year into it. Then the reviewers emailed us back and I told them, I know they're going to accept it, they're going to accept it. Not going to publish it. What? They said, we call uncle on the science. You've proven that. It is causal. But the way you're ending your paper glorifying oral health care providers and stating they're going to be the ones that take heart attack and stroke off the top of the list, they said, you, we're not going to publish that. So they haven't done enough research to prove for sure how do you treat these pathogens, what's the cost of it, what's the side effect of how you treat it, and how do you maintain a healthy mouth? So Amy and I thought about it. Well, they 
bought the science, we're done with that, so we changed the ending of the paper to this. The dental community has a substantial opportunity, okay, <laughs> to mitigate the number one cause of death and disability, cardiovascular disease, by elucidating, do some more research, feasible, effective management of periodontal disease with iris pathogens. So we resubmitted it, said, okay, we're done. We'll publish it. So what we're talking about with high-risk periodontal pathogens being a contributory cause, if you want to think about it, I think a good analogy is driving under the influence. We would all agree there will be some automobile accidents today caused by driving under the influence. Unfortunately, some people probably die from those accidents. We'll also agree there'll be some accidents today that had nothing to do with driving under the influence. And I think we'd also agree some people will drive under the influence and they'll luck out and won't have an accident. <laughs> but because of those latter two facts, are we gonna go back and say, oh, well, we don't need to worry about driving under the influence then because some accidents happened today didn't have anything to do with it. That'd be crazy, right? We got laws against it. We should have laws against high-risk periodontal pathogens. So your work is critical. Better check my watch. I'm... Keep going, brother. <laughs> <laughs> You're the man. We should have... Yeah, give it up. body association that makes this man and Amy and uh, the superstars of the dental profession. What, put that slide back up there, Brad, please. The, Which one? Listen, yeah, the dental community one. Because the more of you, the, one, the dental community, right? <laughs> oh, that, yeah, the dental, yeah, yeah. We are the dental community, and we've got this opportunity to change the world, to you know, we be working hard to control these pathogens, but first we gotta identify them. And then we gotta go after them and kick them like and take you as serious as a heart right. attack because Yeah, right. No, you're right. That's great, Chris. So again, I wanna make sure you leave this room today knowing how important you are. And you are saving lives. So this is one very important element because these high-risk periodontal pathogens and periodontal disease are extremely prevalent. We need your help, so thank you for what you're doing. I do want to cover quickly the other element of oral health, the endodontic disease, because this study was published in the American Heart Association Journal by Dr. Pessy a few years ago. He took 101 people having a heart attack, okay? So he got that big acute blood clot in there, giving them a heart attack. He took 101 of them. He went in and sucked out the culprit blood clot to open up the blood flow. Then before he withdrew his catheter, he sucked out blood from a different part of the body. He analyzed those samples with DNA for oral pathogens. The first finding was the clot was 16 times more concentrated with that DNA than the blood, arterial blood. 78% of the clots had the bugs that caused dental caries, the strep, 78%. 35% had the bugs that caused periodontal disease. Then he looked at nine of the clots under electron microscope and he saw bits and pieces of oral pathogens in every one of the clots. Three of the clots, those bugs were still whole I don't know what that implies to you, but it certainly implies to me they were wiggling around when that person had the event. And then he randomly selected 30 people and imaged their teeth. Basically half of them had periapical abscesses, most of those in a root canal tooth, so the patient didn't even know they had a problem. And if they had that type of lesion, their clot was 13 times more likely to contain the strep. 
So they concluded in this American Heart Association journal, basically a huge percentage of acute heart attacks are being triggered by oral disease. And Amy and I sincerely believe when the dust settles, and it'll probably take, it may take 20 years before we have enough data where it's absolutely conclusive, but we really believe they're going to show eventually somewhere around half of all heart attacks are being triggered by oral infection, and a lot of that is dental caries and these periapical abscesses. It's like the last straw. It doesn't mean that actually caused a disease initially, the periapical abscess, but it's like, hey, I'm, I'm done, the artery says. I'm so weak now, it's just going to blow and you're going to get the clot. So this is what you absolutely have to understand. And if you understand this after my presentation, I'm happy. Nobody should be able to shake your tree on this. The number one health care issue in this country is cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. They're killing more people, disabling more people than any other disease. They're also the most costly disease for our country. And you can have a huge impact on that with your work. So Amy and I are thrilled to be able to present to a group like you. And again, if you're just an office staff, just an office staff, it doesn't matter. That's an extremely important position. Your whole team has to be on board with this message. And certainly the hygienists are the ones that are really getting in there and cleaning up that periodontal mess. So they deserve tremendous credit. So we've got to start dissolving the boundaries between medicine and dentistry. You need to start talking about this. Talk about it with your colleagues. Talk about it with your patients. Talk about it when you go to a social gathering. <laughs> but all cardiovascular disease programs have to have a strong oral health component or they're going to fail. There's no way Amy and I would guarantee our work if we didn't have you standing right beside us. There's no way. We'd be crazy to. Because we run into fires that'll start in the arteries all day long that are due to periodontal disease or endodontic disease. And if we don't have colleagues like you standing right beside us who can quickly go in there and do your magic, clear that up, our patients are going to have heart attacks and strokes. We'd be refunding a lot of money. So we have to build those bridges and to do that we have to talk the same language and that gets back to what Chris alluded to a minute ago when we send a patient to one of our oral health colleagues and we're worried about periodontal disease we do want to see a perio probe chart it's important the bleeding the probing depth clinical attachment it's important but if that's all you give us we're sending them back <laughs> Because it's the bugs that cause the heart attack and stroke. It's the bugs that cause the risk. So we have to have reports like this, where you're telling us, along with that chart, well, what are the pathogens involved here? And you've got companies out here that'll do that testing. That's one, that's another, that's pocket points. The other was salivary. And this one does tongue pockets and salivary. So that's what we want to see. We have to talk the same language. If you send that patient back to us and all you give us a probing chart, it's not what we want to hear. We want to see that, but we want more than that. And preferably, we want the genetic testing for inflammatory response. And if we're worried about an endodontic lesion, and they have certainly a root canal tooth, and we send them to you, and you send them back with a regular radiograph, we're going to send them back. That's not the language we want to hear. We want 3D cone beam because it's much more accurate. It's like 96% accurate compared to your other radiographs at 73, 72%. So we have to speak the same language, right? And then what we're speaking coming from our perspective is inflammation. So you need to know what these inflammatory tests mean to us. 
Well, why, why did Dr. Donine send me this patient? She says she's worried about it. Everybody and be strong. Be anchored in the science strongly enough where nobody's going to shake your tree. And we would argue to get there is to take our two-day 17.5 hour course. We have a lot of dental providers that take that. A lot of hygienists, dental staff members, dentists. And we have never heard a bad word from any of them after taking the course. It's all positive, like, oh my gosh, I learned so much. Now I am strong. So we'd love for you to join us at one of these two-day courses. We have a mixture of medical and dental there, so we're building the bridges, right? So the next one's coming right up in Vegas, and you can get a $500 discount if you put that code in, but it's coming up real soon, <laughs> March 9th and 10th. Our next one after that's Atlanta, and that'll be in November. But we would encourage you to get even more science and then we've created a dental endorsement package for dentists who do take our course. And we have an eight and a half hour online course too. So it's not like somebody has to come to the two day, that's the best. But they can get the basics from an online eight and a half hour course. And once they understand that information, then they qualify for the Bail Donine Method endorsement. And we make flyers like you can put in your waiting room that come at it from a medical standpoint your patients help reinforce what you're telling them how important all this is and they need to get this done and I, I'm going to say this because I imagine a lot of people in this audience know who Chris DeBall is she's an excellent peri, a hygienist who's been doing that for over 40 years and Amy and I just brought her on in the Bale Donine method as our oral health liaison. And we're extremely happy to have Chris Duvall working with us. So if any of you have questions about this dental endorsement, you could go to our website and connect with Chris Duvall because she's very engaged with it. So individually, we are just a drop. Together, we're an ocean. There is strength in being together. We have to break those bridges and come together on this. So thank you very much for letting me come in today. I appreciate it.